young people can help save the planet with Cliff Lewis. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we're going to look at ways that young people can help make Earth a better place to live. Later on this show, we're going to be talking with Cliff Lewis, author of We the Future. This episode is aimed toward young people, but there are plenty of lessons in here for yeah. everyone. So keep Thanks. watching, regardless now, of your age. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution, the Earth's climate has been rapidly changing due to human activity. Primarily the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and gas. In fact, it has been 46 years since our, pl since our planet last experienced a year with cooler than normal temperatures. This means that the last time the global mean surface temperature was below normal was 1976. That was the year Apple Computer formed, releasing the Apple I, the Viking One lander touched down on Mars, and we all bought a copy of Frampton Comes Alive. It's been a while. Now, I know you've heard the term global warming before and you might think it just means the Earth might be getting a tad warmer. You buy a few more for you to shorts, no big deal. But here's the thing. Global warming is already resulting in some pretty serious problems with more to come. The production of greenhouse gases is causing the Earth's temperature to increase leading to rising sea levels, more frequent and intense natural disasters, and setting off a cascade of plant and animal extinctions. Rising temperatures are causing glaciers and ice caps to melt, which would result in more flooding, more intense storms, and the pollution of water supplies for large cities. It's too bloody hot. Climate change is also resulting in more extreme weather, like heat waves and droughts, which can harm crops and lead to food shortages. Ocean temperatures are also rising, driving deaths of coral reefs, as well as a loss of biodiversity. But there is hope. We can take action to protect our planet and prevent the worst effects of climate change. We can reduce our carbon footprint by driving less, using renewable energy sources like solar and wind power, and eating a plant-based diet. Did you know humans share about 98% of your DNA with pigs, compared to just 90% with cats and 82% with dogs? Pigs even play video games. So, may I recommend a yummy fruit smoothie for breakfast? Uh, young people have the power to make a difference, advocating for policies prioritizing the health of the planet and, su and supporting sustainable practices. You can speak out about the, ur about the urgency of policies affecting climate change, encourage others to take action by your own example, striving toward a more Earth-friendly lifestyle. Next up, we talk with Cliff Lewis about his new book, We the Future. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Cliff Lewis. He is an author and a speaker, and his new book, We the Future, is aimed at telling kids in middle, group, middle school uh, about, 
about uh, the very real dangers of climate change and what they can do about it. So welcome to the show, Cliff. Hey, James. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Anytime. So uh, give us, I always love to start here, give us a little bit of a look into your origin story and how did you get started down this, down this life of being a writer and speaker? Yeah, well, I, um, you know, I wrote lots of books when I was a kid and just I loved to play in my imagination. And it took me quite a few years of adulthood to realize that that was something that I could actually turn into something more sustain, su su substantial than just a daydream. So, you know, eventually I learned that I can put pen to paper, so to speak, or put a uh, finger to keyboard and draft a little bit every day. And by the time I'd get to the end of a year, I would have a book. And so I started developing that skill over the la over several years. And it wasn't really until it was, you know, one novel that I developed that just didn't quite get off the ground. I couldn't quite find a home for it. Um, and after that, I, when the idea for We the Future struck me, it was one of those ideas that the moment it, it you hear it in your own head, you know that this idea just has to become a reality. Mm -hmm. So I was struck with the idea for We the Future due to a number of like very unusual life circumstances. And the moment I had the idea, I started writing it as fast as I could. So it was very much inspired by some experiences I had in real life. Um, I met a real life youth climate activists and they were all in my house and over the course of several weekends, it was during a local political campaign, a congressional campaign. And this was for a candidate locally that was going to be advocating for some really strong, bold climate policies. So climate activists came out to our community in a small town in Pennsylvania, and they came from uh, all across the country. They came from California. We had people, we had one activist that came all the way from Australia. Um, and was was supporting the campaign. It happened to all be stationed in our house, helping us run canvases. And I saw the passion in these young activists. And I'd been aware of the climate crisis before, but I'd never understood that this was something that people were literally dedicating their lives to this fight. And when I saw that passion, it was really the first spark that led to the idea of a story that represented the, those kinds of people and those kinds of young people that are driven by this incredible fiery passion to win back the kind of future that they know their generation deserves. Yeah, so that's it's amazing when young people, you know, really try to change the future for the better, you know. And do you think that is because climate change could be such an existential threat. You know, their their very future is being um, being threatened. Or do you think? And and how do you think that other factors might play into this? Yeah, I think. Well, I do think it's you know the climate crisis has been something that's been on on everyone's radar for decades now, and you know, my generation, you know, I have kids in middle school now, but when I was a kid growing up, I, I, I knew what the greenhouse effect was. I understood roughly what climate change was. Um, and for years it was represented as, as something that was almost like a conservationist concern, mm -hmm. not like a almost near apocalyptic concern, but more like polar bears. Right, Let's right. think about the polar bears, right? right it was right. polar bears and it was some vague concept of sea level rise for a long time. And it's not until fairly recently that we've started to see even on like the domestic shores of the United States, we've seen some of, some of the ravages of a changing climate and what it means to be caught flat footed in a world that does not align with generations and generations of our expectations of how the world is supposed to behave, how the planet is supposed to behave. And we've witnessed that more recently. And now we're looking at generations where 
this this young generation in middle school right now will will be alive and well in in the latter part of the 20th century where many of the the more dire projections for the outcome of un, unfettered climate change will really start to come to roost they know that they're going to have to live in the world so if it were you know if it was my generation of kids kind of coming up in the 90s uh we weren't taking to the streets about the climate crisis because there was there was no indication that this was going to be a massive dire concern for our own personal lives at least not to the extent that that's true for young people today so the the further we move into the 20th century 21st century the more young people are going to be acutely aware of how serious this crisis really is and how it personally affects them rather than it being sort of like a, a do-gooder tree hugging type of cause it's like there's there's self-interest there's a right. large degree of self-interest in this issue now for for any young person who knows that this is the world they're going to inherit hmm. it's, it's wonderful it's a uh... So powerful. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us just to give us a little bit of a brief intro to your story and uh, tell us a little bit about, about what it's about? Yeah. So so the idea, and I had alluded to this earlier, but I was inspired by meeting these activists. And then it was a little while later, I was listening to a podcast episode with uh, where they were interviewing uh, David Wallace Wells. Uh, who had written uh, a really great nonfiction book called The Uninhabitable Earth. And he was being interviewed about it. And he he pointed out that we have a lot of literature, a lot of stories in popular culture that feel like metaphorically related to climate change in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, that it's kind of exploring the crisis on some level, um, but not. But so often, a lot of our storytelling doesn't address the crisis head on. And he was sort of like, felt like he would, to me, as, an, as a creative person, as a writer, it felt like he was issuing a challenge. And as I was listening to this episode, I um, was struck by an idea. I thought, I want to tell a story about the climate crisis that not only is directly about the climate crisis, but also is about dealing with it. It's not about the future, about showing you, like, it's not about characters living in the future. It's about present day kids grappling with this challenge ahead of them. Um, but a story that really makes the stakes feel very concrete and real and immediate. And also, I wanted to write a story that would, would show young readers what they can do about this, what they can really do about this. So the idea that struck me at that moment was the idea of this this boy who is just racked with climate anxiety and his name is Jonah and he feels utterly helpless utterly hopeless because he's aware of this looming disaster that he's he's made more acutely aware of because he's just recently developed a, a very fairly serious case of um of asthma that causes him to be incredibly sensitive to to polluted air and is likely the result of having been exposed to polluted air. And he looks at a future where the air will be worse, where perhaps perhaps public health systems that he relies on to, to provide medication that he needs, like he wonders what if that stuff's not around? What if, what if things don't work the way they do now in the world that I grow up into? And so he just feels completely helpless. He doesn't know what to do and he's desperate. And this boy Jonah, out of the clear blue sky one day, he is met by a girl who is from the year 2100, who has come all the way back from this, this, this 22nd century. And she shows up and she recruits him into a mission, and a mission that she came back specifically to, to incorporate him into, which is to launch a climate strike big enough to rewrite history and fix the future that she has come from. So the story is a little bit science fiction. It's a little bit time travel, um, but across the board, it's a story about, about organizing. It's about direct action. So it kind of puts those building blocks of how do you build a crew? How do you form a movement? How do you canvas? How do you have conversations with people, find out what matters to them and recruit them into your movement? And then ultimately, how do you stage 
a direct action that's going to get people's attention and and state a clear demand. So it really frames out a lot of that. So it's a it's a climate book, but it's also a climate organizing book. It's very much about organizing and community organizing. So it's like a story about how you can make friends by saving the world and how you can save the world by making friends. That is awesome. And um, of course, you know, young people, you know, like the ones that, you know, stayed at your house um, can do activism, can, you know, create uh, protests and, and such. But what can kids do? The nine-year-olds, the ten-year-olds? like Jonah, perhaps, who aren't meeting people from the 22nd century. What can yeah. they do to help make a change? Yeah, well, the, the one thing that I like to emphasize in this book is that you're really never too young to start organizing yourself together with other like-minded folks who are concerned about the same issues and are, are willing to fight for the same concerns. So younger students reading this book, I think they can form clubs in their school, they can form organizations, and they can also align themselves with organizations that are doing this work. There are groups like, um, and I have a link out at the, the end in, in the um, author's note in my book to a page on my site where I kind of walk through some of the things that kids can do. And a couple of things you can kids can do is they can get involved with an organization like Sunrise, which is, is probably the out of all the climate activism organizations and youth climate activism organizations, it's the one that has kind of the most organizing muscle that provides real solid, meaty volunteer opportunities to people. And some of those opportunities are even, even remote. Sometimes it's you're helping to run a, a text banking campaign where you're having, but via text, you're having conversations with people about the issues or you're making phone calls, or sometimes it's just showing up you know, showing up at the events that are being organized by these organizations and standing up and being counted. But there are also groups like Fridays for Future, which, which was the nation that was really spearheaded by the actions of Greta Thunberg. And that's also a group that provides resources and tools for how to, how to do your own climate strike in your school, how to pick a day, how to communicate with school administrators if needed, and talk to your parents and actually in a, in a safe and, and respectful way um, provide some, deliver some much needed civil disobedience and, you know, maybe, maybe make a stand with other students that are willing to do the same thing and, and, uh, and sit, sit outside the school or sit out of school for the day to make this, to make a large statement. This is the kind of stuff that young people are starting to do increasingly, um, to really, to put themselves out there and, and not just talk about making a change, but really start to demand a big change. Hmm. So who are some of your inspirations, both as far as writing goes and as far as activism and uh, activism and goes? Yeah, well, certainly my almost all of my heroes in terms of activism are right here from my community where I live. I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I made so many friends through organizing that one campaign that ended up becoming the inspiration for my book. And we have a local organization called Lancaster Stands Up that is, is fighting for climate justice as long as, as well as many other forms of justice. And the people who lead that organization are, are just such incredible folks who understand how to organize people, how understand how to uh, lead conversations that really start with the person you're talking to and what's important to them and what values they hold right. and guiding them through a conversation to see where their values intersect with the needs and 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 the injustices that exist currently in the world and, and finding ways to pull them into that. So there are a lot of pioneers in that field right here in my own community. And I learned so much from them. So many of those people are reflected in the pages of this book. Um, but as far as literature around climate, especially climate literature for younger readers, there's straight stuff that's just starting to come out now. When I first wrote this book, it was a few years ago that I started drafting it. And there I was Googling around and hardly finding any books about the climate crisis for middle school aged readers. And now we have really excellent books like Two Degrees by Alan Gratz, who you had on the show yeah. a few months ago. And um, that book is excellent. I could not 
I, I made a whole uh, video review about that book and put it on my TikTok just because of how excited I was by it, because it does something that my book sets out to as well, which is not sugarcoat what the climate crisis is and what it can mean and how dire it can be for young readers. I think they deserve to know what's at stake and they deserve a chance to, to fight back and in whatever way they they can so i think that's a great book there are a lot of other great ones haven jacobs saves the planet is a great um a great uh environmental organizing book um the first rule of climate club is a good one too paradise on fire is another a lot of these all came out in the last like year ish so um so these are all there are a lot of great books for young people um and i would just say like what i think i'm contributing to that that growing library with We the Future is that my book is about the climate crisis, but it just very directly focuses on how do we organize ourselves and how do we apply collective power to, to make a difference. And that's, I think, something that young people can learn and start using right now. And it's something they'll be able to take with them as older um, it's an invaluable skill to understand how to apply people power to big problems and ask for big solutions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Cliff. It was fabulous talking with you. Yeah. Thanks so much, James. Yeah. And that was Cliff Lewis, author of We the Future. Check it out anywhere you get your books or head on over to HeyCliffLewis.com. So, here's the good news. We can do something to help reduce our carbon footprint. When you need to travel, consider having fun and getting some exercise by walking or biking wherever possible. Or take public transportation instead of driving a car. Uh, young people can also talk to your parents about the benefits of driving an electric or hybrid vehicle. In addition, household solar panels and rainwater harvesting reduces demand on utilities, decreasing our use of fossil fuels significantly. This can save a significant amount of money in your home's electricity bill as well. Hear that, parents? Another important thing nearly all of us can do is recycle. Some other ideas are to reduce waste by using reusable water bottles, lunch containers, and bags. Now, some people will downplay the effects of personal choices in protecting the environment. And although it is true that large industries create vast amounts of environmental damage, consumers have the ultimate power to make them change. Large, unscrupulous corporations do the damage they do for one reason, to make money. As consumers, we have the power to support alternatives to environmentally damaging products and practices. We can choose to buy products that are made sustainably and reduce harm to the environment. We can support companies that prioritize reducing their carbon footprint and investing in renewable energy. If enough of us make these choices, we can have a real positive impact on the environment. We can show companies that there is a demand for environmentally friendly products and practices, pushing them to make changes to their merchandise, products, and policies. Finally, get involved in your communities. Join a local environmental group, attend climate rallies and marches, and make sure you're educating yourself and others about these issues. Now, as life springs to, well, life around us this season, let's celebrate the plants and the animals and the fungi and other things around us by doing what we can to help save the planet for future generations. We can all plant the seeds for future generations. Don't leave it for others to do. We all need to be pollen in the same direction. Let us get to the root of the Next week on the Cosmic Companion we have a special guest for Earth Day. We welcome Sandra Postel, a director of the 
global water policy project to the show. Wait, what's that? Greetings, mortals. I'm Poseidon, Greek god of the sea. I'm also god of earthquakes. And, for some strange reason, horses. I'm basically a walking Jim Morrison poem. Ahem. I assure you that water is one of the most precious resources on the planet. On Earth Day, the Cosmic Companion asks the question, water is more important. Answer? Not much. Dive on in with us starting on Earth Day, the 22nd of April. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cosmic Companion, feel free to comment, share, and tell all of your friends about the show. It might just help the planet. We are Scott.